If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Amy Strauss is an author and blogger living in Ohio. She's an urban homesteader, student, and home economist. She writes all about micro farming, modern homesteading, and more. Welcome to the program, Amy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, um, you are a small urban farmer or a micro farmer. How did you get into that? Uh, yeah, you know, it happened quite by accident, actually. Uh, over 10 years ago, I was a, a high school teacher. I found my job to be fairly stressful, um, as anyone can imagine, working with teenagers. And I was also experiencing some health issues that, um, you know, a lot of pain that I was dealing with. I was looking for something therapeutic, a sort of hobby that I could jump into. And um, I decided to take on gardening. I had never gardened before. I kind of uh, think of it as my dirt therapy, you know, having my hands in the dirt, uh, you know, having the sun on my skin, uh, tinkering with plants. I found it to be so therapeutic, actually, that I kind of dove in um, <laughs> kind of in a geeky way. I started studying soil science. I became uh, certified in permaculture, which is designing agricultural landscapes that work with nature. And I started taking on garden clients, garden design clients in my community. And I even started a community garden. And so all of this tinkering that I was doing in my yard and in my community actually sort of uh, morphed into this second career for me because I found it so rewarding and contagious. So I started sharing um, what I was learning through my experiences on my website, 10 Uh you, you grow in a very small area, area, and tell us about your homestead. It's a tenth of an acre, which people may not be familiar with the size of that, but you produce a lot in that very small area. Uh, yeah, actually, um, yes, the original 10th acre farm uh, was very small, one tenth of an acre, so that's how my website got its name. And yeah, we were just growing on a small suburban plot in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. Um, we did have a lot of challenges that regular gardeners uh, experience, um, you know, dealing with small spaces, uh, poor soil, sloping land. And, you know, it was a challenge, even the shade. Those were all challenges that I was dealing with in my yard that I think a lot of, you know, residential growers have to deal with. But, you know, one of my biggest challenges was uh, growing in my front yard because that's where I had the most sun and the most open area to grow in. So figuring out how to grow um, in the front yard so that I still had a good relationship with my neighbors, um, managing water properly, uh, making it very aesthetically pleasing, and um, also being very productive. You know, that was a big challenge for me. Um, so those were all the things that I was experiencing. The front yard ended up being a, a very integrated permaculture landscape with a lot of um, perennial fruits growing. I had currants, black raspberries, cherries, strawberries growing up there. And, um, you know, all of these experiences actually I'm excited to take into my next uh, experience, which now I'm living on three acres. We've recently moved. Uh, but all of these things that I learned will be, um, you know, applicable here as well because most of our three acres is wooded. So I'm still growing in a very similar sized area. Well, whenever you were growing in the front yard there, was there any restrictions based on the city ordinances and where you lived that prohibited you from doing certain things that you wanted to do, or was you able to work around those restrictions by incorporating things where other people may not notice them? Uh, there weren't any specific restrictions that I was working with. Um, I know that a lot of people deal with that if they live in an HOA or some something like that. Uh, but what one of the things that I was doing because I love you know the science of it all and experimenting and and um, figuring out what works, uh, you know that's all part of what uh, you know makes me come alive. And so when I was experimenting in my front yard, I wanted to find strategies that would be applicable for anyone, even if you were living with 
you know, restrictions about what you can grow. Uh, the landscape ended up being very beautiful, and um, nobody would know that it was, you know, an edible landscape um, unless they were familiar with those types of plants. Oh, and then now do you, since you've moved to the three acres, do you have animals now, or is that something that you're wanting to, per- uh, to incorporate, like chickens with, for eggs and that type of thing? Uh, you know, actually, when you speak about restrictions, that's actually one restriction that we have here. We're still in the suburbs, and so we're not zoned agricultural, and we actually are not allowed to uh, keep livestock here. Okay. Um, so you, you, you know, you consider yourself a modern homesteader. Many people think of homestead as livestock, green stock, and more. Obviously, you can't have the agriculture cultural aspect with the livestock what makes somebody a modern homesteader would you say you know i think this idea of being a homesteader is kind of rooted in this idea of you know providing some of our own needs and uh, being more self-sufficient and so i think that we can carry that spirit into uh, our modern ways of living regardless of you know the old, um, the traditional way of homesteading is to have a more rural landscape where you've got a lot more land and you can really be, you know, work toward full self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency. But I feel like we can do that in the suburbs and in our urban spaces. And I, I've been seeing a very, um, a, a big comeback in this area in recent years. I think people really want to have some you know, grounding in their local environment. They want to have a connection with the spaces um, in which they live. Um, it's kind of a response to this hyper-technological um, world that we're now living with. Um, when we can go into our backyards and have, you know, a relationship with that space and grow some of our own food and feel connected to it, uh, I think that it Um, You know, of course, in my case, I can say for sure, it becomes this um, therapeutic experience, but also very rewarding when you can meet some of your own needs, uh, no matter, you know, the size of your space or what you're dealing with. I've even heard of, you know, uh, apartment dwellers who consider themselves homesteaders because, you know, they're focusing on uh, uh, finding, uh, sourcing local, um, you know, food and then, you know, preserving that harvest for the winter. And they're doing that for themselves as a response to, you know, this consumer-based lifestyle. So I think we can have homesteading um, in this modern sense, regardless of what our living conditions are. Well, you manage what is called a CSA. For people who are unfamiliar with what a CSA is, what is that? And how can people anywhere in the world or in the United States find out where they may have a CSA at and, and be part of it? Uh, yes, I have managed a CSA in the past. Um, when I first started over 10 years ago, I got involved in a CSA as a participant, and CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And in this uh, type of setup, you have a, um, a relationship with a local farmer. Uh, it's a subscription-based model. So at the beginning of the growing season, you would pay an annual fee. And um, this is sort of an investment into your local farmers. And it helps them buy seeds and equipment and materials to get the season going. And, um, and then in return, you get a weekly share of produce. Usually, it's a CSA modeled in produce, um, fruits and vegetables, but I've also seen CSAs that are um, selling uh, meat products or dairy products. So the CSA model can be, uh, you know, applied to any agricultural situation. But when I was involved in the CSA, um, first as a participant, I found it to be incredibly rewarding, so I joined the uh, management team there. And it was uh, incredible to see what goes into feeding 100 families. That's, uh, you know, the um, administration behind that and the hard work of the farmers to coordinate it all and make it happen when every year you're dealing with different, you know, temperatures, changes, 
uh, rainfall changes, and different weather conditions that are beyond your control. And still, you have to figure out how to eke out, <laughs> you know, this uh, produce for the number of shares you have. It's an incredible experience. And what I find is that the CSA program helps us learn how to use and preserve um, you know, the food that's coming in throughout the garden season. So when you go to be a gardener yourself, you'll, the CSA is kind of a stepping stone that helps you get um, connected with that side of things, um, what to do after you've harvested things. And I think CSAs are pretty easy to find. Um, there are some websites out there, but, you know, the easiest way is just to Google, you know, CSA and then, you know, the name of your community. So I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I would just Google uh, CSA Cincinnati, Ohio to see what comes up. But it, a lot of those CSAs are popping up, um, especially surrounding um, metropolitan areas. Great. Now, what are some tips for starting a garden on a small budget? Uh, you know, I think we can use tips for starting a garden no matter if we have a big budget or a small budget. My answer would be the same because I think, um, you know, as gardeners, we're so excited to get started um, when we think about having a garden. So that my first suggestion is to start slow and to start small. Uh, when you start with a small garden, you can always work up. You can always increase your garden space over time as you learn to manage it. What we don't want is for you to start out as a beginning gardener um, with a very large space to garden and you quickly become overwhelmed and we don't want it to become something that's not enjoyable. We don't want it to become a source of stress. We want it to be, uh, you know, a rewarding experience. So when we start up, or start small, learn a garden in a small space, then we can work our way up to bigger spaces. Uh, my other suggestion is to um, be a collector of uh, organic matter. So whether that means becoming, um, you know, starting a compost bin of your own, uh, worm composting bins are an excellent way to um, compost your food scraps, uh, whether that's calling a local tree company and starting to get um, free deliveries of wood chips or whether that's going around in the fall and collecting leaf bags from your neighbors who are setting their leaf bags out um, as waste. Collecting all of this organic matter is going to uh, really be helpful when you go to start gardens because as gardeners, we never have enough organic material, and it's going to help us uh, build healthy soil and prevent pests from the get-go. Absolutely. Well, Amy, we greatly appreciate you coming on the program. How can people find out more information about you and follow your journey? Uh, you know, people can find me on my website, tentacrefarm.com. And um, I, I have a special uh, gift for subscribers of my newsletter, which is my Guide to Organic Soil Amendments. And, you know, what I was just mentioning about collecting organic material and how helpful it is and important it is for building healthy soil, it's also very important to choose the right organic amendments for your particular situation. So the free guide that I have for newsletter subscribers will, will help people um, choose the right amendments for that, their situation. Uh, also, my book, The Suburban Micro Farm, it really gets into the challenges and barriers of residential gardeners, uh, especially uh, dealing with, you know, poor soil and shade and sloping land. I get into permaculture a lot in the book. So I encourage people to check that out. Uh, it's called The Suburban Micro Farm, and it can be found at thesuburbanmicrofarm.com. And you can find me on social media, actually. Um, I'm Tent Acre Farm. You can find me at, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, Amy, we thank you very much for coming on, sharing your knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank Absolutely. you, Amy. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.